play a tune like Ground Speed, all that kind of backward and forward rolls, a lot of the same stuff as in Katie Hill. The rolls in that are a lot of backward rolls and forward rolls, so if you develop that same driving right hand feel that you get with Scruggs style, in there. So it's all the right hand, it just really brings it out. Yep. This is a real novice question. Could you demonstrate all the rolls separately? The different rolls. All the rolls? separately. The standard uh, bluegrass kind of rolls, like in Scruggs style? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Just a little demonstration of, of, the, very, of the most commonly heard bluegrass rolls. Billy, want to take on a few of those? What are those trade roles? Well, <laughs> Role playing. <laughs> you know, there are there are really about a dozen of them, uh, but they have permutations. If they shift sideways in time, they sound like something completely different. So, uh, uh, but you can you can actually break it down into uh, uh, small number of kind of units or the way to think about it. Uh, here's. Here's a few I kind of relate in the same field. Uh, one where the thumb keeps rhythm. It's doing that. And if you can do that keep with the thumb keeping rhythm, then you try it out with the other fingers, like uh, the middle finger. And then so you can do the keep uh, notes coming at an even rate uh, from the higher string. And then in the middle, with the index finger, and so those are three that are in the same family, and those two, they're only three, because we only use three fingers, so each one has had its choice to keep time. There's three of them. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, it, that, that really shifts the accent just with the one roll you're talking about. Right? That was, uh, no, that's three rolls, the three rolls. Mm -hmm. Here's one through the various flavors. Take this one, which is, uh, 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 normally I think of it as the index is doing the timekeeping. Yeah, that's what it's doing, the index. So if you shift it one notch, then, uh, so the index is off the beat, and then the thumb becomes on the beat. Uh, so that's the same roll, it's just shifted, and then you can move it, shift it the other way, so the middle finger is on the beat. Uh, as often as, uh, except now I can hear the third string. So, uh, so those, that's one roll through three of its flavors and three rolls in each one in one flavor. Or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be like maybe in certain specialized tunes that have a specific melody that really, you know, require a certain roll pattern through a number of measures. Yeah, right. but even a tune like, uh, well, let's see, uh, 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 I learned this roll uh, with the middle finger lead, more or less uh, for old Joe Clark. But if you shift it sideways, uh, so you hear the emphasis on the other beats, because now instead of... Is, came out uh, is necessary uh, for that particular part of that tune to use an, uh, a familiar role in an unfamiliar way. Yeah, another thing about those roles, I think it's a good question because uh, not only to demonstrate the roles, but to really get a good grip 
on the forward roll and the backward roll be able to mix those up uh, at, at, at will because uh, in a lot of Scruggs style playing and even in a lot of melodic you have to really go fluently from forward to back so if you can just develop you know, take your forward rolls, take a couple of forwards a couple of backwards mix them certain famous Earl Scruggs licks that have that that's a classic right there two backwards a forward and a backward starting on the first string one backward another backward forward and with a backward right after that it gives it a get the it's just the coolest sound right there I always love the way he did that and be call rag on the foggy mountain banjo album. That's really what makes it, is that little rhythmic thing there. If you just do a forward roll, it's just, it's kind of a little boring, you know, so that, the way he makes that note hop around. Uh, exactly, you just hear that uh, hopping around, you just hear that note just kind of hit you in an unexpected place. And uh, uh, shucking the corn, same thing, isn't it? Yes. Something like that in there, that... Something like... Yeah, mostly back. Well, kind of breaks it up toward the end of that, but it's the same kind of thing. Did a lot of that in um, Lonesome Road Blues, little things up the neck. Uh. That kind of thing. And it's the same effect. That's all, it's just a forward, backward. Alternating forward and backward. So if you get some control over those rolls, you can really get some nice effects on your tunes. There's another roll that uh, actually they call the, I've heard it called the reverse roll, which is half forward and half backward, very common. And uh, it makes, uh, it, there's eight notes to it, so it fills up one measure, so you can count off the music, sort of, you know. Uh, uh, sort of just measures out the, the, the chords, uh, in a way. And uh, that's, uh, Earl uses that a whole lot, that roll. Uh, the beginning of Earl's Breakdown. Uh, Flindale Special. Uh, there's one. Here's another. And another. And another. So they're all over in there. Flying out in time. phrase with that uh, same role. How about After all you start to hear the rhythm associated with that lick and then uh, then you pick it out in the crowd. Do you know which lick, how he's moving his fingers just because of the rhythmic element that's in there no matter what chord is being going by, going by at the time. Yes. Um, yeah, I think yes, in general it does. Uh, if you're leading with the thumb, trying to play, play melody with the thumb, and the melody goes across the neck and comes out or near the top strings, it, 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 <laughs> you're, if you try to play mostly with your thumb, no, the thumb does play on the first string, but you can't do rolls very well because your other fingers are already past it. So you kind of shift the lead rolls of the lead uh, to a different finger. That's kind of the way I think about it. Or I'd use a different roll that uh, gets the rhythmic emphasis off of the string you want to be playing the melody on. But when you do that, and you play the melody with another finger, does that turn your roll upside down? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, uh, generally, I think you just try to learn as many roles and learn which one has the best potential. And then as you're approaching a melody, you try to uh, uh, kind of use the ones that work the best in that situation. Uh, you can't really do uh, everything with one role. Uh, oh, there's a here's another one role that turns into two. It's kind of neat. Uh, uh, the uh, most people, in fact, I guess the first time I heard it was Foggy Mountain Breakdown, uh, where. Uh, plays that the thumb comes down to the second string for the third of eight notes. I'm hitting it a little harder there, you don't have to. Uh... The same role here so on other parts of the tune. Well, if you begin that roll instead of with the, the the first, take those two notes off and put them on the end and begin with the thumb. Then you play uh, Song, but it's the same as Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Sure doesn't sound like it, but it is. And you just shift it so sideways to do that. Any other uh, technical questions? Uh, yes. Uh, Yeah, well, in that case, I was kind of hearing a melody that I felt, you know, so, uh, and it's not real typical of, tapes of flattened scrotes in the 50s when they would just do a fiddle and banjo tune. They had the greatest backup behind this. But we can maybe add a couple of lead uh, melodic breaks to it also. Yeah, yeah. Probably not.
I'll send you some backup things. I remember hearing on that tape. There's really neat behind the fiddle, y'all. runs in there and just these really neat ways of going into that F. Nice fat F kind of sound there, and then back up to the C. And then tagging out with that little A minor. That kind of little slur, like a fiddle kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, variations up here, uh, on the... Uh, by listening to fiddle players. There's a great fiddle player in Baltimore. I, I just love his music, John Glick. And uh, man, I've played with this guy for years. I just hear all these little things. And one thing he always does in a tune like that, um, say you're, you're something going from C to an F, instead of doing a full C, you play, well, I tell you, I don't know a lot of theory behind it. Bill can explain the theory. But he's basically playing an F7, but really sort of like a playing a C minor, you know, over the F. So you have that, uh, works great over this F, because a lot of those same notes are in there, and I don't know all the theoretical yeah, reason for that. Yeah, it has the 7, it's like an F7 here, it looks like yeah, a but it just has that kind of neat sound. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, you just hear some little catchy thing, and that, that little lick has caught me for years, I do it in all kinds of tunes, even if it's a... Uh, into a C, you know, something that's just a G tune to a C, has that same kind of thing, and just, just a little snippet like that would be something that just, you know, I'll go after. And then just, uh, yeah, just listening to fiddle players, and mandolin players, everybody else too, but fiddle, if you're going to do a fiddle tune, you may as well listen to a lot of fiddle music, because there are little things you can do, with, you can add to the banjo, even that little bit on, on um, Katie Hill, you can get like little slides in a fiddle fiddler would do that. Or, yeah, maybe like a little thing like that. Um, yeah, just that little dotted eighth note right there. Just yeah, like on uh, Wheelhouse, I try to play that as close to the fiddle break as I can. Um, I'll try a little bit of that, and I'll try to do the uh, second part closer to the way that I hear the fiddle player do it. It's another Bill Monroe classic, Wheel Hoss. I'll try a little bit of this for you.
he has some those beautiful ways of slurring things and just to get to, you know, just like a little thing like that, and just just the timing yeah, kind of a thing. So it doesn't not really out of a role, but just like just one little phrase. Okay, yeah. Um, now I've been experimenting a lot myself with setups in recent years, always looking for a nice, full, rich sound. But it's always hard to do. Sometimes you tend to maybe try heavier strings, loose bridge. I mean, a loose head, real thick bridge, that kind of thing. But I'm finding lately that you don't want to go too uh, too thick with the bridge or too loose with the head. I mean, banjos, man, they are critical instruments, aren't they? I mean, they really are just, they require incredible, they're like, to me, it is like, like a trampoline. I know there's a, <laughs> a banjo joke about trampoline. We'll get to that later. But it, it, it really is, it's like the head tension has to be just right. And if it's a little bit too loose, it just bottoms out, it's too tight, you don't get anything out of that. But if there's a certain place where you get the head tension where the whole thing comes alive. And if you get the bridge just right, tailpiece, certain kind of gauge of strings. In fact, lately I'm lightening up on the gauge of the strings. These are the J.D. Crow GHS light strings or something. Uh, but any light will do, really. It's not like, you know, you could have to experiment with some different gauges to find what works for your kind of playing. Do you have to change your right hand uh, uh, a little too? Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually starting to lighten up. I used to play heavier strings real hard and all that kind of thing just from playing in bands where you're playing with maybe not such great sound equipment so you tend to, yeah. you know, overreact and dig in harder and just defeating yourself. And I'm finding that there's really a sweet spot. I used to stay away from light gauge strings. I thought they just wouldn't do enough. And here's an interesting thing about light gauge strings. If the rest of the banjo isn't balanced quite right, if the head is too loose or too tight or the bridge just isn't quite right for it, light gauge will feel like rubber bands. There's nothing there. You just feel like you're getting nothing. But when everything else is set up right, the same set of strings will feel tighter and they'll give you a whole lot more. But I'm getting a deeper sound now with light than I was when I had 10s on the first and 14s on the third. It's, the, it's going the other way. Um, one other little thing about that, and we can get way into the banjo setup, but I mean, basically it's head tension. And a lot of people talk about getting the head tuned to a G sharp. It's not a bad idea to try that. If you can tap the head, you can usually hear a tone. Just by tapping. Can you hear that tap? That's right about G-sharp. That seems about right. I mean, you could vary it from banjo to banjo, but that seems to be a certain place that flathead banjos vibrate really well. If you go much tighter than that, they start getting that kind of a raspy sound, and much looser, there just won't be any kind of bite to it. Because you want that mixture of sustain and depth, you know, all those characteristics that we love so well. <laughs> Yeah, and the nice thing is with light gauge, you can play so much easier. You can do pull-offs easier. When I was trying to do them with heavier strings, I, I, I had the hardest time doing that. But they snap a lot better with the light gauge. Uh, other than that, it's a lot to do with right-hand position. Even the type of picks you use, how you bend the finger picks. Give the picks a little more of a curve to them. Not so straight, and they'll have a little bit more of a round kind of a tone, a fuller tone. Uh, the thumb pick, even in the in the Earl Scruggs book, did you did you write all the um, the setup? Uh, we, well, no, we, you, we wrote the text and we talked it over, and, and it was yeah. not uh, my opinion. Was that right? I just happened to look through that the other day. hadn't looked at it in a while. Notice he talked about the rounding off the thumb picks. Yeah, sure. taking taking the point off of the the picks. I just started doing that recently. Uh, it's like really making a difference. I mean, some picks you get they have like a long hook on them, and I usually kind of stayed away from picks like that. It never occurred to me to actually go ahead and reshape them, but yeah, just sort of give it a little more of a blunt curve right there, and that'll help a lot with your tone. We both uh, appear to be using the same uh, Dunlop large uh, picks uh, called Calico by some, and they, uh, they they don't wear too fast. I'm pleasantly surprised, but taking yep. a long time for this to wear down to where it's flat uh, on the end and gives a bigger tone. It's a little pointier tone than I usually like, but I, I want to wear it in and not... You can scrub a, a thumb pick or, or a, fing, a flat pick on a piece of cardboard and uh, just rub it back and forth real fast and the heat actually melts the end of it. You can shape a pick real fast that way. Take off more than you want to uh, sometimes. Uh, but uh, I've been waiting for it to happen naturally because... Uh, but these are two real good picks. 
You know, another thing you can do is use your thumb as much as possible because that has the nice full kind of a fat sound. Earl did a lot of that in his playing. I mean, unexpected places, you know, that intro to Foggy Mountain Breakdown, I've heard people talk about how they would watch Earl play, and right off of the pinch, the first hammer he would hit would be with the thumb, for some reason. You're like... Only the first time. Yeah, yeah just the first time. You can't do it for something like that. <laughs> yeah, you only get one shot at that. I mean, it's subtle. I mean, it's really subtle, but there is a difference. Just right there. Just the sound of the thumb hitting that hammer. As opposed to some little thing like that. I mean, Thumbs further you know. from the bridge, so it gets a rounder tone, just uh, it's closer to the middle of the string. Yes, sir. You mentioned further, closer to the bridge or further from the bridge. Where do you usually pick, and then do you shift up and down the string in order to get different tones? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Um, well, uh, I, I think uh, you can... Uh, a little uh, trial, or just test it out. Uh, here, uh, deeper, rounder tone up here, which is more. Uh, I like it better for backup and rhythm kind of playing. And I actually sort of turn my hand a little differently, and the heel of my hand's on the head against the fifth string. So, and if I hit the fifth string, it just makes. Uh, percussive sound there. And, uh, but for lead, keeping your fingers real light, never press down on the head, and also don't actually hook into the bridge and push on it or touch it, because then your hand will, if you get comfortable there, then you won't feel comfortable anywhere else. But you get, get used to moving along the strings and close enough so you get uh, of a sound as you want and and then shift up here for a, a, a warmer tone and very often Earl will play uh, both ways uh, Snuffy Smith, and I have filed this down. I'll tell you, you can spend a lot of time studying bridges, and I've been messing with this a lot. You know, I mean, talk to Snuffy about them, give him a call someday, and he'll run down the whole deal about the different kinds of tones you can get with various grain spacings and all that. But uh, just you can experiment if you can just maybe, you know, they get a little expensive, you're going to get a bunch of those to experiment with. If you want to get into that, just get a handful of the standard Grover bridges, they're usually three or four bucks. I'd recommend getting you know, five or six of them, play around with some different widths, uh, even string spacing uh, across the bridge has, can affect the tone a good bit. But yeah, play around with some different thicknesses of bridges and kind of see which way leans toward the tone you're looking for. Uh, you don't want to go too thin, and if you do, you just start getting that kind of reedy, thin, trebly sound, won't be able to get any fullness, you know, to it, so. Any other questions about that, about a bridge? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we talked about that maybe before you got here. This is uh, called a moon bridge, uh, I guess, because of the shape. Uh, and uh, it's uh, compensated, uh, meaning that it gives the third string uh, more length than it gives the first and the fifth. This is to correct for a problem that uh, uh, some banjos have noting right on the third string way up the neck. If you, uh, I use a straight bridge for years, and uh, if you never play above the middle of the neck, you won't notice it. But if you get uh, uh, start playing up there, see that? Maybe the strings are a little old, but it's pretty close uh, to being in tune up there. With a straight bridge, it couldn't be, as it turns out. Uh, but uh, as Mike says, bridges used to be 
a, a buck, you go in and get a couple, and then you and there were no choices. You know, want a banjo bridge, or here it is. You know, a buck. It's amazing what a difference a bridge can make, even the same brand. And a couple of Snuffy's bridges, you know, I had one on one banjo that didn't work at all on that particular instrument. It sounded great on another one, you know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the moon bridges do real well on some, but there are some banjos that don't require compensation. And, uh, and uh, well, then there's the hotspot bridge, a uh, yeah. bridge that the guy at Wadsworth makes out of 150-year-old piano wood. And, uh, bridges that were in, growing in a tree when uh, Joel Sweeney right. uh, made the five-string banjo out of a board. Yeah, there could be a lot of hype there, but I think there's something to it. I mean, the people who've really studied the bridges, you know, and, and put a lot of thought into it. Well, you know, the, the weight is a big factor. Yeah. Uh, the thin bridges re can react quickly, uh, so they have a real good attack but they don't sustain as well as a heavy one, which once you get it moving, it tends to keep on moving. So that, uh, uh, and I look at the whole thing as sort of a, uh, well, imp matching impedances in a circuit. You got heavy strings, then you, then you can move a heavy bridge, but if you have real light strings, don't go with a heavy bridge, you won't have any volume. You can't, you know, and uh, so the strings feed the bridge, the bridge has to get the head moving. So uh, an important element of it is it's the area of the feet. Where, uh, uh, so bridge that's spread out kind of and has wide feet would probably produce more tone. And then the head itself has to be able to vibrate it at low frequencies if you want to hear low notes. And since, well, low frequencies, the excursion will be greater, whereas with high frequency you have lower excursion uh, and a higher frequency to have the same energy. So. You tune the, the head low. Now I have my head tuned to about an E. And just a little sharp of an E. And uh, so that maximizes that. Uh, and that low uh, uh, bass sound, which I'm real fond of. People don't tell me this doesn't record too well. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> Being drier? That's what I hear. When it's a, if you're increasing separation so you don't have a lot of overtones, then it's a, a drier effect. Uh, but then it gets a little too dry, and that just sounds kind of dead, you know. So that's it's up to your ear, you know. One man's dry, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. Because uh, you know, it's finding that critical balance of sustain and depth, and not too many overtones. It's a tough thing on the banjo, and that's why you have to sort of keep all those in balance: the head tension, bridge, gauge of the strings, even the height of the tailpiece can make a dramatic difference in the tone. So you have to experiment with all of that. The best thing to do is get around somebody who has an instrument that you really like and study that particular setup and try it for yourself. Because all the rest of it kind of shooting in the dark. Yeah. 34. Just the, the pot is, the neck is about 20 years old. Uh, Chris Warner made this neck. Chris Warner out of uh, Hanover, Pennsylvania. Gibson style neck. Yeah. This is a 93. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, both Del McCurry and I uh, arrived in Nashville the same day. We both had banjos in our hands. And Del was hired as a banjo player, and he ended up playing guitar. And it seemed like Bill McCurry started using banjo players. Like, when I was growing up, there was like two schools, of strut style and key style. Um, it seemed like Bill McCurry started using banjo players that played more like you than he did like strut. And like when he first heard of Del, and here in Baltimore, it was Baltimore. Uh, yeah, Dell plays in a more traditional style than I was in. in the, so, uh, I was just curious, it's like since Bro uh, used both you, Bro seemed to use your style more after you started playing, but he didn't play like you. Um, would it be fair to say they're both traditional styles since Bill Bro is down? Well, you know, in Earl, Sc Earl Scruggs in his day, when he, in 1944, when he stepped out there, 
it was totally blew everybody away. It was totally different than anybody ever heard it, uh, and uh, it was very avant-garde. It wasn't traditional at all. I mean, uh, uh, sure. What I'm saying is the same thing sort of happened again in a way, uh, and it's still happening. There are players that come along with great new stuff and more techniques and everything, and. Uh, 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 unfortunately, Bill's no longer around for them to play with. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I felt, uh, well, gee, I was honored that he thought that he liked that style. Uh, and that I guess within the first couple of weeks, we recorded uh, five or six instrumentals. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, it, was, I, it was some great personal satisfaction for me. Uh, I was trying to do what he wanted me to do. That's a great point because it's really interesting that it's, it's so ironic that it's considered a, it is an innovative style, but it's actually truer to the traditional feel of a fiddle tune, even than, than some of Earl's playing. How long you know, yet it's all still considered that modern stuff, or it's still it's like that new thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody, I think, plays a melody. I mean, to call something a melodic style is sort of funny because everybody's trying to play the melody of tunes. I think. Uh, what tunes are, or melodies. But in some regions, it's still against the law, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? It seems like the Scruggs style to me has a more, well, not rhythmic, but it's like, almost more of like a more percussive, percussive yeah. effect, whereas you have more of the actual melody to be able the actual tune. Yeah, I guess, but you know, I think that uh, the melodic style uh, may be more appropriate to fiddle tunes that people didn't use to play on the on the banjo at all. But uh, I think for you know a hard drive and bluegrass vocal or for a, a bluegrass song, because we're talking about melody notes, a fiddle tune has lots of melody notes per measure. You know, uh, they're almost all melody notes. You know, but you take. Uh, 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 You got uh, one note that's going to hold for a couple of a measure or longer, so you you don't want to approach it like a fiddle tune where every note's a melody note, and uh, because uh, you're trying to sustain one note there. So uh, as far as the rolls go, that's oh she's coming. But there was a that's where the forward roll kind of comes into the picture to me uh, when you're trying to simulate a vocalist and sustain a note. And uh, when a forward roll kind of makes that happen, to my ear. But it's too, the, there's a place for each style, and to play everything in one style or the other, I don't think would be taking advantage of the instrument or doing justice to the music. Uh, and there's other styles too. The single string style of Don Reno's can be really good and absolutely essential in playing in parts of the melodic or strugs down in the low strings. Single string is all the way go. So. I think, you know, the challenge to banjo players these days is trying to, that more and more is out there, and if you are here last night and heard Bela, it was like a miniature course on what you can do on the instrument, and uh, it was great to see and hear, uh, and uh, even if you don't like uh, all the music he plays, you have to admit that technically he's doing stuff that uh, has added a lot to the possibilities on the instrument, and uh, I think... I think it's harder than ever now to to learn uh, representation of all the techniques that are out there and try to apply them all. And uh, you know, it's becoming more challenging, which is great. I mean, uh, banjo's evolving. Yeah. And it's this living music we got here, and uh, living and breathing. We gotta watch it as it grows up and uh, give it a whipping from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Not very good at that, and actually, uh, Earl uses that all that, all that kind of. Uh, the only one I know, kind of halfway, is uh, a little follow the leader. If we did that, uh, yeah, not too not fast. fast. Uh,
know, that style is, is very similar to uh, the, uh, well, the, the way um, notes are made on mandolins and guitars, jazz guitars uh, included. Uh, and that, uh, using the thumb and index, just like a plectrum, down the thumb up with the index. And uh, just... Uh, It's really hard to, to do, uh, well, uh, I need more practice myself, but uh, that's simple in concept, but uh, hard to get everything out of it. Can be hard. Yeah, I don't do much with that at all myself, but one thing I've been learning about that is it helps to, in, in some cases to get away from the bridge a little bit when you're doing that single string. I've seen Bela do some workshops talking about that, and he doesn't do a lot of it right. Up next to the bridge, it kind of gets away. If you watch him play a lot, he does a lot of his stuff right in here. It's a little bit more of a round. Where the notes just kind of pop and they sustain and ring just, just right, right in with each other. Yeah, that kind of thing. They just, they just blend a little bit better together. So if you're working on that technique, try getting a little bit away from the bridge. Try to get the notes to sort of meld together a little better. Got the word to do one more there. Which one do you want to do? Blackberry Blossom? Which one? Old Ebenezer Dangerfield. Ah, uh, well, I'd like to do that, but I don't know. Uh, uh, well, do it to the version of that one. Uh, go ahead and do that one first. Okay. Uh, all right, got a request here for a little Old Dangerfield Ebenezer. I'll run through that and uh, Bill will finish it up.
Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Double banjo. Well, can that be done on... How about Andrew Clark? Sure, that'd be perfect. Yeah, Okay. Double banjo. Parallel melody. Major and minor thirds. And sixths. Okay, good. Let me switch. There's a five tenor in the 